Welcome to Silicon Bytes, episode 17. It's been a couple of weeks now, so there is a lot to catch up on. And it seems like this Friday especially has delivered a torrent of news, which is at the same time shocking and unfortunately not shocking at all. That includes the continuous bombardment of Ukrainian cities, Ukrainian civilians by Russian missiles. More people are being killed every day. People who are going about their everyday business, shopping in markets, walking in parks, going to cafes, strolling through town squares. It seems that no one and nowhere is safe in Ukraine. And these missiles are coming from somewhere. They're coming from Russian occupied territory. They're coming from Belarus and they're coming from the Black Sea Fleet, the ships of which continue to threaten Ukrainian cities and Ukrainian waters. And that leads us on to our first story, which some of you may have noticed in the community chat, a fairly strongly worded statement with regards to Elon Musk. And he has launched an absolute tirade of outrage and pushback due to a number of tweets he has sent and due to a new biography that has come out, which makes some extraordinary claims about his role in the war and specifically what seems to be Musk's propensity to fall for Russian propaganda and certain channels of communication he seems to have with Russian ambassadors, foreign policy advisors, and potentially even Russian propagandists. And he has launched several Twitter posts on this topic. I'll read the first one out. Elon Musk, there was an emergency request from the government authorities to activate Starlink all the way to Sevastopol. The obvious intent being to sink most of the Russian fleet at anchor. If I had agreed to their request, then SpaceX would be explicitly complicit in a major act of war and conflict escalation. What this means and what the story seems to be saying, if we dig into the details of it, is that Elon Musk has interfered in a Ukrainian military operation. He has leaned on the scales in favor of the aggressor, in favor of Russia. He has prevented a fully justifiable Ukrainian act that is designed to blunt the Russian war machine, to limit the Russians' capacity to launch aggressive missile strikes against its civilian population and potentially to shorten the war. According to the stories, Musk's actions didn't just deter this operation, but actually scuppered the operation when it was in full flow. That means that the Russian fleet escaped the destructive power of Ukrainian seaborne drones. And that same fleet still exists. That same fleet is launching missiles against Ukrainian cities day in, day out, killing civilians. Now, is this naivety on Musk's part? Does he think that by saving Russian armor, by saving Russian military capacity and the lives of Russian service people, service people who are engaged in an invasion of their neighboring country, does he believe by saving those lives in the short term that somehow he is not prolonging the war, that somehow he is helping to bring the war to an end? Absolutely not. He's prolonging the suffering of the Ukrainian people. And by allowing the Russian armor to fight another day, he is prolonging the death and suffering caused by this war. He is prolonging the regime of Vladimir Putin, a regime that substantially relies on the war continuing without disastrous losses to the Russian military. He here, of course, is the word escalation. It is not escalatory to try to take back your own internationally recognized sovereign territory. It is not escalation to fight back against those who are trying to kill you, eradicate you, destroy your language, your culture, your political system, and your economy. But Musk has quite clearly drunk deeply of Russian propaganda narratives. He released another tweet that said, both sides should agree to a truce. Every day that passes, more Ukrainian and Russian youth die to gain and lose small pieces of land with borders barely changing. This is not worth their lives. This is another disgraceful comment. It shows that he has fallen prey to the Russian narratives, to the Ruski mere way of thinking. 
To equate the aggressor and the victim in this fashion is not just disgusting, it is strategically stupid as well. If Russia loses the war, Russia will continue to exist. If Ukraine loses the war, there will be no more Ukraine. He simply does not understand the genocidal intent behind Russia's invasion. And if you don't accept that basic fact of what is going on, then these propaganda narratives still retain some of their ridiculous power to inform decision making. So what sources is Musk consuming in order to believe this stuff? Well, it does seem, again from these reports, that he has a direct line, not only through to Russian ambassadors and policymakers, but also to Vladimir Putin himself. It's entirely possible that Elon Musk may have given away details of Ukrainian military operations, access he gains through the Starlink network to Russia itself, thereby not just preventing military action, but actually giving a decisive strategic military advantage to the aggressor. Some of you will not like this statement, but Musk is on the side of autocracy. Musk is on the side of imperialism. He's on the side of the genocidal aggressor. And Musk now clearly has blood on his hands through his interventions to prevent Ukraine from achieving decisive victories in this war. Through his acts, no doubt he is perpetuating Vladimir Putin's autocracy, and no doubt he is perpetuating the war, the suffering, the death, and the killing that results from it. In this episode, we won't need to visit Clown World because Musk has brought Clown World to the West in all of its disgraceful glory. Musk has wrapped himself in the bloody red, white, and blue flag. And the US government should now seriously be considering how much of a security threat he poses to the US strategic global interests. Now let's take a look at some stories from the Kiev Independent, the Moscow Times. There is a lot of stuff to cover here. As many of you will have seen from other YouTubers who cover this in a lot more detail, Ukraine has been making not just incremental gains on the southern front, but seems to have been punching through the Surovikin line, the fortified defensive line that Russia was hoping would help to freeze the conflict and prevent Ukraine from making any advancements. Why is this crucial? Well, winter is coming up. There is an election coming up in the US as well. And if the front lines were seen to be frozen, to not be making any progress, that would start to create serious divisions amongst the Western allies. There would be those arguing against sending more munitions and more powerful munitions to Ukraine because they would argue it's not making any difference. The clamor of voices seeking to sue for some kind of peace no matter how unrealistic, no matter how harmful to Ukraine's interests, that clamor of voices would only increase if Ukraine was not able to make progress on the front line. This is why, with Ukraine punching a hole in that defensive line, and let's be clear, that has not come easily. It's come at a tremendous cost in terms of Ukrainian lives. It's come at a cost as well in terms of the armor and munitions that have been lost in doing that. Nonetheless, it's extremely important to see that Ukraine can make successful advances against these Russian defensive positions. Potentially, if they can capitalize on that and push through, they may be able to make significant advances before the winter sets in. And that will be absolutely crucial to fortify world opinion, or Western opinion at least, and support behind Ukraine as we start to enter the winter period, where potentially again, some of these significant advances may prove to be more difficult. But the Kiev Independent also reports on an almost daily basis about Russian missile strikes hitting Ukrainian cities. Just this morning, another one killed one person and injured at least 56. This is a daily toll of horror. And actually, the shocking aspect of this is not that Russia continues to afflict its aggression. That we have been expecting. It's the failure of bodies like the UN to condemn the genocidal aggression that we're seeing. It's also the media who've become inured to the horrors. There's a blunting of our humanity if we can just dismiss these daily horrors as, oh, well, that's Ukraine, that's Ukrainians. 
These are people like us trying to live lives like ours and are subject to these horrific risks and in the worst case, injury and death. And this should never seem normal. This should never become normality. As if we normalize the abnormality of these horrors, we will lose some of our own humanity. And eventually, we will also lose our freedom as well. And other important stories that have happened this week, the Ukrainian oligarch Kolomuisky uh, is behind bars. This is part of the ongoing effort within Ukraine to tackle serious issues of corruption and nepotism. And these issues aren't just theoretical. They can have a drag effect on the Ukrainian economy that can have a negative effect on Ukraine's ability to fight the Russian aggressor. And this is also the hint behind the ending of Alexei Reznikov, the Ukrainian defense minister. He has resigned amid rumors of the latest corruption allegations. Now, he has weathered the storm before earlier in the year and last year when other allegations came to light about contracts which were not in favor of the armed forces or the state. The details of these are quite sketchy. The details of the latest corruption allegations also have not been confirmed, but more will, I'm sure, come out in the coming days. On the other hand, taking a balanced view of Reznikov's tenure as defense minister, he's also been in charge during a period where an extraordinary amount of support has been lent to Ukraine. He has been crucial in negotiating with Western partners to get the kind of munitions that Ukraine needs. And if we look in the long view, the kind of weaponry that Ukraine is now able to deploy on the battlefield was absolutely unthinkable just a year and a half ago. And Reznikov has played an absolutely crucial role in helping to get Ukraine tooled up, not just to survive, but to take the fight to the Russian aggressors. And another story which could have important implications of the coming weeks, and that is that the US is to provide Ukraine with another military aid package. And crucially, this package is to include ammunition for high mobile artillery rocket systems, high Mars, and also it's been discussed that depleted uranium shells will form part of this tranche of military supplies. This has caused absolute consternation in Moscow, where they're seeking to weaponize the narrative around depleting uranium. They're seeking to link environmental catastrophe to that topic, ignoring the fact that apparently they themselves have been using this kind of ammunition since the start of the war last year. Again, more hypocrisy from Russia and them using the eco-side argument, of course, is outrageous when we consider the kind of ecological damage and the ecological terrorism that has been unleashed over the last year and a half, including the Kovka Dam, the Zaporizhia nuclear power station, and of course, many of you will remember the extraordinary incident where Russian troops started digging up the soil in the Chernobyl exclusion zone, thereby releasing toxic radiation into the atmosphere and apparently poisoning themselves into the bargain. And there is an interesting pattern in this US supply of weapons. It does seem to be more and more focused on delivery of armaments that will have specific tactical advantage in punching through Russia's defensive lines. We can only hope that this kind of coordination between the US and the other allies and Ukraine and what its troops need on the ground, and specifically what Ukraine needs in order to win, not only continues, but intensifies over the coming months. Now let's look at the Moscow Times because there are some interesting stories to cover off here. Drones targeting Russia's microchip plant. This is one of what seems to be a daily series of explosions across Russia, many of them linked to important symbolic business facilities or to production facilities. Some of them, of course, are military focused, some focused on producing components both for military and civilian infrastructure, but it's the scaling up. It's the brazenness of these attacks that I think is impressive. Now, we suspect Ukraine is behind them. Whether those drones are coming from Ukrainian soil or whether they are sabotage units actually based deep in Russia, there is a lot of debate going on around that. I think for the Russians, it must be more worrying if these are units operating from Russian soil, because it means there's no real geographic limit to what can be hit by them. 
As yet, however, it does not seem that these attacks are turning the Russian public against the war. And I'm not sure that's the actual point. I don't think the Ukrainians would have believed that these drone strikes would suddenly magic up an anti-war sentiment within Russia. What they do, however, is they stop the Russian population from pretending that this war is just something that happens on their TV sets. It makes the point that the war is real, that it can affect them and their livelihoods, and whether they want to remain neutral or not, the war is coming to them. Now, next week, we're going to do a number of interviews around the militarization of Russian youth and society. But here's an interesting article in the Moscow Times that really ties in with that. And that is that teachers have apparently resigned because they refused to allow Ukrainian veterans into class. What we mean by Ukrainian veterans, we mean Russian aggressors, we mean Russian soldiers who have been fighting in the Kiberis campaign since 2014. Um, some of these teachers are quoted as saying that advocating for war in the context of the classroom is wrong. Now, this is quite a brave move because it means they will no longer be able to work as teachers within any of the state infrastructure in Russia. In fact, quite likely they will be blacklisted to work anywhere after making these kind of stances. But it also emphasizes the importance of the Russian regime places on the militarization of youth and the brainwashing of its civilian population, not just in the provinces, but now in the larger urban centers as well. And this creates a real dilemma because unlike Marxist Leninism, which was fairly abstract and obtuse and which most people in the 70s and 80s already didn't really believe in, and they could just sit in these classes and, you know, snooze through them. Patriotic education is different. You won't know if you're sitting in that class whether your classmates are fanatical Z patriots, whether they are neutral, whether they are different, or whether they are opposed to the war. You dare not try to reach out and find out who believes what, because that could have dire consequences for you. What we are seeing here is a move back to the Soviet mentality, the compartmentalization of people's lives, where they have secret discussions at home, where they may critique the war in private, but they dare not share those views in public or in the workplace for fear of reprisals and even prison sentences. This means that children of parents who may be opposed to the war and I'm not making any assumptions about the quantities of people who foot in that category. I don't think anyone can actually know that figure at this point in time. But these parents are having to now tutor their children to create a private persona and a public persona. And in no way should they reveal their points of view in public. And another story which doesn't get an awful lot of coverage, and that is Russia pressuring migrant workers with raids across Moscow and other large cities. Now, for anyone who has lived and worked in Russia over the last couple of years, they'll be very much aware that many industries, including construction, catering, and so on, are heavily reliant on migrant staff. And in fact, this goes back a couple of decades, even in the period I was traveling uh, in Russia in the 90s, you already had people from Central Asia coming up and doing all sorts of skilled jobs, including restoration work on Russia's heritage churches, buildings, etc. And of course, civilian building projects. It now seems that under the guise of immigration police, authorities in large cities are actually rounding up, arresting and potentially even sending to the war those migrants whose papers may not be in order. And anyone who knows Russia, potentially people who have papers that are in order, may also be sent to the front as well. Now, this betrays a certain perhaps desperation to shore up the number of available people that Russia has to fortify the front lines in the south and the east of Ukraine. It's likely that this desperation to get, to get bodies, to get cannon fodder to the front lines, it's likely this will only increase in the coming weeks and months, especially if Ukraine makes more progress in its southern push in Zaporizhia. And lastly, here's a story we are going to cover in more detail in a future episode, and that is the West's reliance on Russian nuclear fuel, which really is helping to fund Russia's war machine. 
There are, of course, Western corporations also still operating in Russia. And again, we'll be tackling that in a future episode as well. But the world is witnessing the unprecedented spectacle of a civilian atomic energy station being occupied by a foreign invader, writes the Moscow Times. And that is an extraordinary terroristic act of the Russian state in the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant in southern Ukraine. What many people aren't aware of, however, is that the Russian Atomic Energy Authority, Rosatom, is not sanctioned under the international sanctions regime. It continues to operate around the world, planning, building, maintaining nuclear facilities in many countries, including within Europe. And there was a lot of speculation as to why Rosatom has been left out of the international sanctions, despite the fact that it is clearly implicated in terrorist acts within Ukraine itself, the terrorizing of the nuclear workers in the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant and the use of that plant as a kind of dirty bomb threat, which along with the use of tactical battlefield nuclear weapons is one of Russia's key threats and pressures that it puts on the West to limit the amount of armaments and support that is provided to Ukraine. Without these atomic terroristic threats, the West could have potentially impose a no-fly zone on Ukraine in the early part of the war, thereby saving thousands of lives and bringing the war to a much earlier conclusion. The only reason these things are not happening is that Russia is a nuclear power, and not just a nuclear power, and one that is not averse to using this nuclear power to threaten the entire world with an unimaginable Holocaust. And for what real benefit? And that brings us back into a kind of closed loop for this episode, because it is that very nuclear threat, that threat of a so-called third world war, which many Russian observers do not believe they're serious about. You know, We believe they are very much bluffing when it comes to the nuclear threat. And yet, unfortunately, decision making in Washington and other capitals, and especially the acts of individuals like Elon Musk, are very much influenced by Russia's incredible threats to use its nuclear power, damage the West, to damage the world if it doesn't get its way, if it isn't allowed to continue its aggressive, imperialistic, genocidal invasion and subjugation of Ukraine. So it's not only Russian propaganda narratives that pose an incredible risk to our democracy, our freedom, and our systems of governments, our institutions. It's also the individuals that imbibe those propaganda narratives and act upon them like Elon Musk.